Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president and co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I'm Liz Cavell, associate counsel at Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we're going to discuss the heartbreaking, distressing demise of Roe versus Wade, which is creating crises and chaos here in Wisconsin and throughout the nation. The Supreme Court's recent decision by an ultra-extremist supermajority, as you know, overturned Roe v. Wade and obliterated women's constitutional right to bodily <coughs> autonomy. Joining us via Skype to talk about all of these developments is Barbara Alvarez, formerly the Anne Nicole Gala Reproductive Rights Intern, and now a contributing writer for FFRF. So welcome back to FFRF's Ask an Atheist, Barbara. Thank you, Annie Laurie, for having me. It's great to see you and Liz. And as always, you can join in our conversation by making comments and asking questions in the Facebook comments below, or you can email askanatheist at ffrf.org. So before we uh, talk about the legal stuff with you, Liz, I did want to mention that uh, the reason why the Freedom from Religion Foundation, in fact, started is because of the religious crusade against abortion rights. And my mother, Anne Gaylor, who was the principal founder of FFRF, um, it was an early abortion rights crusader, both in the state of Wisconsin and on the national scene. She was on the National NARAL Board and uh, also took the calls as a, a abortion referral, used to refer women throughout the nation, for example, to Mexico City when abortion was not legal. She talks about her campaign uh, in the state of Wisconsin to legalize abortion in her book, uh, Abortion is a Blessing. I think we have a visual of that. And it's this a story not only of Wisconsin, but the early days of fighting the religious extremists. And I did want to read just a little bit from her book, Abortion is a Blessing. And she anticipated in the very foreword that we would lose Roe versus Wade. And uh, she said, this book was written because it can happen here. The right of a woman to choose legal abortion can be taken away unless the political efforts of religious extremists seeking to ban abortion through constitutional amendments are countered in Washington, D.C. and the state capitals. She did not anticipate the Supreme Court overturning its own decision. She thought it would happen through constitutional amendment. She wrote the historic, compassionate Supreme Court ruling of January 22nd 1973, freed millions of women from sexual servitude and from the dangerous traumatic search for illegal abortions. This ruling, our country's greatest step forward in social and moral progress since the abolition of slavery, must be protected politically by the activism of individuals who write letters to legislators, attend hearings, visit their congresspersons, and support groups working to keep abortions safe. And legal, and of course, in this book, she talks a great deal about the religious war against abortion rights. The only organized opposition to abortion is religious in nature. We know that we lost the Supreme Court ruling by um, a 6 3 majority, uh, six of whom were all raised Catholic, one of whom is non Episcopalian. Um, it really is a, a war, a religious war against women, and FFRF would not be here without that knowledge. It was what happened to open our eyes to the harm of religion and government. It could have been something else, but unfortunately, here we are back to square one. So this is a pivotal um, uh, issue for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And here to explain first the decision, uh, this is our first chance to do that on Ask an Atheist, is Liz Cavell, our associate legal counsel. Yes, and I'll just say too, I've read that book um, and it's amazing. And it's interesting because it's, you know, it's dated. It's, mm -hmm. you know, all the stories are very 1970s, early abortion. A lot of it is pre-row stories. And your mom was such a great um, storyteller. Uh, a lot of it is really personal. Um, Case histories. Right. Uh, interactions that she had with women. And she describes these women and their their plights and the way that she interacted with them and helped shepherd and you know actual real life um, women to safe uh, abortion procedures, but it's also just surreal to think that um, this is where we are now 
post row uh, you know all, any and all of those stories are going to be or are what women are living now um, in so many uh, states in this nation which is just um, heartbreaking but um, I'm going to just do a little background on the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health case, because uh, that's how we got here. So um, this you, we've talked about the case on this program before, but just a refresher that this was a case that came out of the state of Mississippi, uh, which passed a total ban on abortion from 15 weeks after last menstrual period, which was long before viability, which was the law of the land in um Roe and then Casey, which was the opinion that reaffirmed the precedent set in Roe back in the 90s. Uh, this law being passed was unconstitutional when it was passed. So it was passed by the Mississippi legislature basically to set up this confrontation through the courts um, and challenge Roe. Um, what's interesting is that in the early years of the litigation, Mississippi was sort of a little more narrow in its um, presenting of the question that it was trying to get the courts to reach. And as over the past few years, the Supreme Court has been stacked by m more and more ultra conservative justices who have basically been put there to uh, do this very thing. Um, Mississippi's arguments to the appellate courts has gotten more and more bold, and to, to the point where when they were petitioning the Supreme Court for review, they are openly asking the court to overturn Roe and um, undo the whole constitutional order around access to abortion. So, so the 15-week ban sort of became incidental, didn't it? Exactly. The, it went from being the what I viewed as Mississippi sort of trying to pu push the envelope back from viability to 15 weeks and maybe get the court to continue chipping away at the central holding of Roe, which was the vi maybe getting them to reconsider the viability standard, um, to uh, openly arguing at oral arguments in front of the Supreme Court when they took this case that the court should overturn Roe, knowing— um, as proved true, that there was now a really solid majority of, of radically anti-abortion um, justices on the Supreme Court. And that's exactly what happened. Um, we heard oral arguments, I think, back um, in the spring and then—or no, in the fall— Jeff in the winter. And then um, I'm, I'm confused because uh, we had this leaked opinion, as, of course, I'm sure everyone is aware that is interested in this case, um, because it was enormous news and it had never before happened in the history of the Supreme Court, where a draft of the opinion was leaked in May before the court actually issued its final um, ruling on this case. Um, and it was just everyone was floored because it was the absolute maximalist position, which was and written by Justice Alito in his, you know, f flagrantly uh, misogynistic style. Um, and it was the overturning full stop of Roe versus Wade and Casey. And um, that ended up being what the court's opinion was. It was not very different from the draft opinion that was leaked. It was six to three. It was a full evisceration of Roe um, written by Justice Alito. And I think we have photos of the six uh, majority, super majority right. extremists there. Yep. Uh, it was the full uh, ultra conservative six justices joining the majority to, um, to reach the holding it did. Uh, the chief justice wrote separately to express his view that he he wished that the court did not um, explicitly overrule Roe. He didn't think that was necessary to decide whether or not the 15-week ban was um, was constitutional or not constitutional. I think what he would have done is just struck down the viability standard as as an arbitrary sort of legal line by which to um, evaluate state. Um, abortion bans, but he wouldn't have um, outright overruled Roe versus Wade and didn't think that was necessary to deciding the case, but cold comfort from Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, so that was that was basically the, the basis of the case and then the opinion itself. Um, and we can kind of get into some of what the opinion said 
Um, we might have talked about some of this back when the opinion leaked. I'm not sure. Yeah, we did. Um, um, but briefly. Um, it's really, it's so hard to talk about this because it's, it's just unreal. But it basically took the central holding of Roe, which is that the 14th Amendment protects um, the liberty interest in the 14th Amendment protects a woman's a woman's right to be free from government intrusion on the decision whether or not to have an abortion. Um, and then that was that was kind of honed in by the court to to mean that before viability, that that decision had to be completely unfettered by government action, uh, which was understood to be basically a, around the 20 to 24 week mark. It was thought of as like a trimester um, uh, kind of line. And then uh, that was uh, refined by Casey to point out that um, undue burdens imposed by the government, the government could regulate abortion before that period, but could not uh, enact regulations that posed an undue burden to access women accessing that care before viability. And that was thought of as a reasonable um, balancing of the interests that were being put forth in Roe to to the the fetal interest being put forth by the the states that are enacting these bans, which we can talk about because, we have a, cert a real bone to pick with the religious underpinnings of the whole state interest in these laws. But um, the court trying to balance those state interests as legitimate, um, but of course the liberty interest of the woman seeking the abortion as being paramount, at least until you get up to that point where there's any possibility of viability uh, outside the woman's body. So that was how Roe tried to balance those interests at the time. The court here in Dobbs basically said that that was egregiously wrong from the start. And he repeated that. Alito must have said that. I don't know how many times. Yes, and that's a that's wrong. a that's a buzzword for what the court is supposed to um, find before it just casts aside settled precedent um, of its own settled precedent. Right? We are supposed to have a system of stare decisis in our courts, which means that um, the courts, including the Supreme Court, follows its own past precedents uh, as the law of the land. And they're not supposed to just uh, disregard past precedents unless several factors are met. And one of those factors can be or should be that the decision was not only wrong, but egregiously wrong. And so we heard that throughout the opinion uh, by Alito. And he... Um, basically wrote that the, the, the central idea that the 14th Amendment liberty interest protects an interest to access abortion is not so. Uh, just past justices got that egregiously wrong, and this court does not believe that the 14th Amendment protects such a right because, in their view, uh, it's not deeply rooted in the history and tradition of our nation, and that is how this court is just um, obsessed with viewing constitutional rights, which is, uh, do, do they have a basis in our history and tradition? And, of course, it's their own amateur uh, uh, history. Yeah, I'm picking a history. Exactly. Uh, that, you know— that they decide that they use to decide this question, and if not, then um, it's it's not embodied by the Fourteenth Amendment. So let's um, look at some of the dissents. We um, I think that we have three um, quotes that are going to come up on the screen. That's right, and, and this was a really strong dissent because it was co-written by the three um, sane justices on the Supreme Court. This is, of course, Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. And, and Breyer really did himself so well in his final uh, goodbye on the court, I think, That's in, right. in his dissents this, this session. Agreed. And uh, so there, there was no one author. They united in um, co-authoring this dissent. And um, the quote that's up now is, whatever the exact scope of the coming laws, one result of today's decision is certain, the curtailment of women's rights and of their status as free and equal citizens. Um, the, the dissent really 
um, took the time to lay out the history of Roe versus Wade and, and, and describe why it was so essential to um, women's equal participation in society and not to let that history be lost um, in the opinion in Dobbs. Yeah, the dissent was uh, about as long as the decision, wasn't it? It was. It yeah. was. It was. Um, it was as long as the majority decision, and it was a a full kind of just uh, lambasting of the idea that um, not only that the court would. Um, treat women's liberty interest so uh, casually and toss it aside, but that the court would be just so flagrantly um, casting aside its own opinions and not observing the, stare the, the decisis. decisis yeah. um, because there are, you know, s there's so many reasons why we adhere to that system, but a big part of it is is the reliance interests of 50 years, decades, um, generations of of women and and not just women, but the the medical profession and the economy and you know the all of our decades and decades of relying on the fact that we have this right Im embodied in our Constitution. Um, and to just cast that aside is is so Agre thoughtless. It's egregiously wrong, It is wrong, egregiously Liz. wrong, and, and it's irresponsible. We have two more slides showing you. Yeah, so, I mean, it's flavor. really one of those things uh, Rebecca Markert, our legal director, said when she read The Dissent. It was one <clears> of those <throat> things where she just was found herself highlighting every word. It was just, um, there's so much good stuff there. But yes, we did want to pull out some quotes to, um, to de just to aid our discussion. This is another quote from the dissent. The majority tries to hide the geographically expansive effects of its holding. Today's decision, the majority says, permits each state to address abortion as it pleases. That is cold comfort, of course, for the poor women who cannot get the money to fly to a distant state for a procedure. Above all others, women lacking financial resources will suffer from today's decision. And we'll, we'll have Barbara chime in on that. And then there's another dissenting quote that we wanted to show. Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that the Constitu Constitution safeguards a woman's right to decide for herself whether to bear a child. Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that in the first stages of pregnancy, the government could not make that choice for women. The government could not control a woman's body or the course of a woman's life. It could not determine what the woman's future would be. And so I think that's a good segue to uh, go to Barbara Alvarez and Barbara Almost a year ago, you joined me and Professor Jeff Stone to talk on this show about threats to abortion rights. And Professor Stone, who couldn't be with us today, predicted on that show last year that Roe v. Wade would be overturned before its 50th anniversary in 2023. And boy, was he ever right, unfortunately. And I remember then that you brought up a Texas law that you warned us was soon going to go into effect called SB 8 that most people had never heard of. Do you recall that, Barbara? And I do recall that conversation very well. And I think many people at the time thought that SBA, SB8 perhaps was overreacting and this will never be held. But far from that, SB8 went into effect on September 1st and it banned abortions at six weeks gestation in Texas. And not only did it do that, but it also appointed everyday citizens as bounty hunters who could be awarded up to $10,000 in court for successfully suing somebody for aiding and abetting an abortion. So it's extremely terrifying, and it's been in effect for almost a year. And um, it's really been downhill ever since then for abortion rights in the United States. So now that Roe um, has been overturned and it's gone back to the states, can you give us some kind of overview of how many other states are banning abortion since the Supreme, decision, uh, the Supreme Court decision came down? Well, it's been complete chaos ever since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This, as of this morning, there are 11 states that have abortion bans in effect. This includes Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Missouri, Ohio, Oklahoma, 
South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. Um, and there are also states that have bans or century-old uh, abortion laws that were never taken off the books. This includes Arizona, Michigan, West Virginia, and FFRF's home state of Wisconsin. So it's important to note that this is creating a really checkered country, as you can see in that graphic, that now where abortion is legal is quite literally all over the map. And it's also important to note that any type of abortion ban is, is awful and detrimental. However, what makes these especially cruel is that so many of them lack any exceptions for rape and incest. And so you, that's what's going on across the country right now. And there are more states within the next 30 days that are expected to have their trigger laws put into place. And we want to talk about that. But first, can we talk a little bit about what's happened in our home state of Wisconsin? Because that map almost makes it look like abortion isn't quite illegal in Wisconsin. And our clinics closed the second that decision came down on the 24th. The, the, it's illegal in Wisconsin, in, including for rape. And incest. It is. So we have four clinics that provide abortion care in Wisconsin, and they all stopped providing abortion care at nine in the morning, the day that that decision was handed down. This is based off of an 1849 abortion ban, a pre-Civil War abortion ban with no exceptions for rape and incest. Now, Attorney General Josh Call when Roe v. Wade, the impending decision by the Supreme Court, was leaked in May, Attorney General Josh Call released an opinion saying that he would not enforce the ban. And Evers also said that Governor Evers said that he would grant clemency to any physician who's charged with violating the state statute. However, that doesn't mean that abortion is available in Wisconsin. The clinics are not providing abortion care when Governor Evers tried to put into place a special session before uh, the Supreme Court made their decision about Roe v. Wade, the session closed within 25 seconds from the Republican-led legislature. That session could have repealed the 19th century abortion ban. So that ban is still on the books. And Governor Evers and Josh Call are currently suing to have this ban removed. But as of right now, clinics in Wisconsin have stopped providing abortion care, and so people in Wisconsin are now forced to go to other states or if they try know. and seek abortion pills. If they know, if they have the resources. And also, it's important to note that I have heard clinics in Illinois, especially the ones that are closest to the Wisconsin border, are now getting backed up by three weeks because of so many people going across the border. So this is impacting people in Illinois as well. And they're also coming in from Missouri. And it looks like Iowa could fall. Um, you know, it, that, it's going to be exactly this little right. oasis. Illinois is going to be the only Midwest state left. We, I'm sure you've heard in the news recently of a 10-year-old who was raped and impregnated by a relative in Ohio, and they had to, in Ohio, granted no exceptions for rape or incest. So that child had to travel to Indiana to receive abortion care. However, Indiana is soon going to make abortion unavailable. So an actual 10 year old child had to go across state lines to receive abortion care. Soon that option won't even be there. So I think it's important to note some people, I, I've seen some people say, Abortion isn't really illegal throughout the country. It's just now a state's issue. Well, that means that now we have half the states in the United States that aren't providing abortion care, and the ones that are are going to be clogged up with people coming from other states. This is impacting everybody, no matter what state you're in. So abortion bans on any level are detrimental to health. And so it's really naive to say that, well, just because Roe v. Wade isn't um, a federal issue anymore. It's now a state issue. We shouldn't worry. We should absolutely be concerned and worried. This is horrifying. Right, because it's important to 
to understand what the court actually did. The court took away a protection, which it's never done in its entire history, to, to remove a right that it previously um, recognized. recognized was protected by the Constitution. And so what it's done is removed that protection, that constitutional protection, and just made it a free-for-all among states who have been, for decades, kind of frothing at the mouth for this moment. So with um, Barbara, you described trigger laws and century old bans on the books like we have here in Wisconsin. So and, and if you remember that graphic, literally that's the the majority of the country falls into even if only half the country currently on the books has um, laws in place that limit or ban abortion, or ban abortion, really. I mean, look at the the blue, the light blue and the navy blue are the only safe places, <laughs> the only places where access really exists right now. Because even places like Wisconsin, where people, you, I mean, on the map, it's it's not gold. it's yellow, it's but gold. It, so it's, that it, it would make you think all those gold states. There's restrictions, some restrictions, but. Um, you might still have access in those states. Well, no. In Wisconsin today, you know, 9 a.m. on the day of Dobbs, there is zero access to abortion in this state because there are legal no abortion. clinics. Yeah. Legal abortion. There are no clinics in the state of Wisconsin where you can get a, uh, a legal abortion because uh, we don't have clarity on what the law is in this state. And if you're going just by the books, we have an... In, 1800s law on our books that says there is it is illegal for doctors to provide abortions here. And this is what and this is in like the second paragraph of the majority decision talks about there was nothing wrong before when this was up to the states and Alita was talking about the 1850s for example and women couldn't even vote. And I right. have said this before but <laughs> two thirds of our state legislators are male. Right. That's true in Wisconsin. It's true around the country. So women are not represented. Right. And of course, there were three, three of them on the Supreme Court, but still a minority there. I know. So um, if I have to read one more like sentence of John Roberts talking about when a woman's late period will signal, like, most women know they're pregnant by six weeks. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> Tell me about your period, Chief Justice John Roberts. And I will say, abortion is a blessing. Read that book if you think everything um, was fine with access before no, that's, 1973. that's exactly what we were fighting. And I would like to point out that in the state of Wisconsin, we had a, a three-judge panel overturn our criminal abortion law in 1970. So we actually had abortion rights a little bit earlier than Roe, although we had a terrible rating of a clinic um, here in Madison, a terrible situation um, later. But we we would never have legal abortion, as you can see in the state of Wisconsin, if we were relying on our legislators. Women and progressives have tried to overturn that criminal law ever since that three-judge panel, ever since Roe versus Wade. And the best we could do was to get women's criminal um, sanctions off the books. It used to be six years of imprisonment for women having abortions. They did take that off, but they left it for physicians or people uh, aiding and abetting. And my prediction is it will soon be back on. Right. And we will soon see, and we have seen, anti-abortion is calling for the death penalty. Because if, if abortion is homicide, then a person having an abortion is a murderer. And what you do with murderers, especially in states with capital punishment, you put them to death. Right. I mean, this is... This is not, um, this is the extremism of the movement, not my hyperbole here. Exactly. But, Rebecca, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Barbara, we want to give you a chance to chime in here, too. Well, I, I'm just here agreeing with every single thing that both of you are saying. It's heartbreaking. And I also would like to say that as of right now, in terms of people traveling out of state to receive abortion care, Currently, at this moment, there are no abortion bans to, that attempt to prosecute somebody for crossing state lines to seek an abortion. That is not guaranteed, though. A law professor from Drexel University, David Cohen, said there is no guarantee that an aggressive prosecutor might try to stretch the law as much as they can. That's why we do need states to become safe haven states like Connecticut and New York. And Colorado. promised. And Colorado and Oregon. promised 
in Oregon. We need more of those states. They have promised that they will not prosecute anybody who comes to their state for an abortion or anybody who provides abortion care to somebody from out of state. So that's important that the states that do still have abortion legal, that's not enough. Now you also need to become safe haven states because we are at a juncture where it isn't just about getting rid of Roe and now we move on to the next thing. They are going to go against people trying to get abortions in any way, shape, or form, and they will criminalize people for providing abortions and getting abortions. And, of course, they've also been pushing the uh, federal ban on abortion. That's right. Which was, was my mother's original fear, a constitutional amendment, um, and, uh, you know, is all pinning on the midterm elections, what happens there. That's so true, and that has been— Openly, that is explicitly being proposed and platformed by um, the ultra conservative um, Republican Party right now is is a just like we need to pass a um, a response to Dobbs in order to protect uh, the constitutional right to um, abortion care. There is a movement still now to nationalize the Dobbs decision by making um, abortion illegal federally on the federal level. It's a, making it a federal crime to um, get an abortion. And that's an open and explicit goal of the movement still. It wasn't just overturning Roe, like you said. Um, the extremism of the movement is to make it so that abortion is not happening anywhere. And it's, that they're is, called abolitionists. Exactly. And they're led by clergy. There was an excellent expose this weekend in The New York Times about the leading abolitionist of abortion rights. Of course, a pastor in Arizona. But Barbara, do you want to briefly talk about, I mean, the Women's Health Protection Act is held hostage to the filibuster, but it, it, is, it is our federal answer if we could get there. We need the Women's Health Protection Act more than ever now, because as we're talking about, prosecutors are going to go after people traveling out of state. And also, we are going to see this intent to criminalize doctors, nurses, clinic staff, not even just people that directly provide abortions, but also people who work and volunteer for abortion funds and friends and family who help somebody receive an abortion, they are all going to be facing legal consequences. So we need federal legislation that protects abortion care and anybody that provides it or helps somebody with receiving abortion, because criminalization is what's next. Right. So, so and, and I might just put in a little advertisement for Elizabeth Warren and some of the uh, requests that uh, the Democratic uh, caucus, half of the Democratic caucus, have made of President Biden, which is to use every federal executive power he has to uh, provide for abortion care, such as VA hospitals could uh, offer abortions in states where they are banned, like us. Uh, they could be providing travel vouchers. Uh, there's a whole host of things. They've suggested an ombudsman, they said. I'd say ombudsperson <laughs> on abortion care. Um, you know, it's it's turned it into just it's just a huge uh, political crisis, and uh, Alito uh, so wrong when he thought this was he pretended that he was going to be solving all of the um, dissent over abortion rights. This is just creating a huge. It's, uh, it's going to be into our lifetimes problems with abortion care. Right. It's. It's an absolute crisis. You're right. It's a political crisis and a social crisis. And the idea that, you know, this the radical majority is just somehow righting this wrong and returning this controversial issue to, you know, the democratically elected um, state legislatures is just an absolute lie. Um, it It's it's just a sticking your head in the sand and pretending that somehow there's a better way than protecting uh, a fundamental right, which right. should not depend on what zip code you live in. Exactly. That's the whole purpose of 
the 14th Amendment is to guarantee personal liberty across state lines um, because of this type of just radical, rabid, uh, anti-women uh, legislation and this movement that will stop at nothing in most of the country, not half, but most. So, uh, Barbara, uh, before we go to questions, uh, where are people going to get abortion care now? What can states do to protect uh, women and pregnant people and providers? Well, there's a few things that I want to mention. First of all, it's 2022. It's not 1972. So in some respects, abortion care and receiving abortion care not in a clinic has really changed. We have abortion pills, which have been legal since, or excuse me, which were approved by the FDA in 2000. They are extremely safe, extremely effective, and there are many services where abortion pills can be mailed to individuals. Now, that really does help in, the, in respect that people are able to access abortion medication in ways that they never had been able to or could have even imagined 50 years ago. However, that isn't everything. We are also in 2022 where we have the internet and cell phones and digital security and digital security issues that we didn't have in 1972. And so in that respect, it's actually, it can be extremely dangerous. Um, we are going to see laws that are going to prosecute people and providers for getting medication abortion without um, without doing it through a provider. So if somebody orders a medication abortion by mail, that is safe, that is effective, guarantee that we're going to see laws prosecuting that. Um, we actually have been seeing this issue of digital surveillance and criminalization of pregnant people for a few years. One of the most um, landmark cases about this was in 2015 when um, Pervy Patel of Indiana was prosecuted under the state's feticide law because she took abortion medication. And what they did was uh, when she went to the hospital, the doctors, I believe, reported her to the police of suspicion that she had done a medication abortion on her own. And so they went through her phone. They found text messages talking about getting abortion pills. And ultimately, she was sentenced to 20 years in prison. However, her conviction was overturned because the Indiana court said, how could a woman be prosecuted for inducing an abortion if abortion is a protected constitutional right? Well, abortion is no longer a protected constitutional right. So one hand, we do have abortion medication, and it's easier to get than it ever has in the past. It's safe, and it's effective, and that's wonderful. On the other hand, we are going to see digital surveillance like we've never had before, and people will be prosecuted. So it's important for anybody providing or seeking abortion medication to find out. Digital Defense Fund provides resources about how you can do that safely and securely without digital surveillance. So that's important. The other thing that I'd like to say is we do have abortion funds that are doing this really important work. The Women's Medical Fund of Wisconsin, which was founded by Ann Nicole Gaylor, um, is one of the oldest abortion funds in the nation and is in the process of developing partnerships with surrounding states so that Wisconsinites who need abortion can travel out of state and receive that care. So that's extremely important. But the last thing that I want to bring attention to are crisis pregnancy centers. Crisis pregnancy centers, I've spoken about them a lot and I know FFRF has too, but we need to be more vigilant than ever about crisis pregnancy centers. These are fake clinics, often Christian-based, and their whole purpose is to dissuade people from seeking an abortion. They use misinformation, disinformation, straight up lies, um, coercion. They offer, um, you know, they claim to offer resources like diapers in exchange for you taking Bible classes. Now, they these are far outpacing clinics throughout this country. Even before Roe fell, there were, I believe, in some states three to one crisis pregnancy centers. Now that Roe has fallen, those numbers have soared, especially in Wisconsin. We have no abortion clinics that are providing abortion care in Wisconsin. We have 
tons of crisis pregnancy centers in Wisconsin, and they are going to be capitalizing on this moment. Try, I've already been seeing it. Some crisis pregnancy centers that I am aware of, they have been putting out messages, trying to get people to come to them now. And what's even more important for us to be aware of is that they receive tens of millions of tax dollars to dissuade people from abortion care. That is a five-fold increase from a decade ago. So they are undoubtedly going to be getting more money. They are religiously affiliated. They're going to get more taxpayer dollars. And we as free thinkers need to not only talk about how people can access abortion safely and securely, including being aware of their digital footprint, but also educating people about the harm about crisis pregnancy centers. So we do have questions, I believe, but before we go to them, uh, Barbara, I know you have a, just a, a little bit of advice about what people can do. So um, right now, the most important thing that anybody can do is to remain active, to speak out, to say the word abortion. Don't be afraid to say the word abortion. If we don't say the word abortion, it just gets further stigmatized. So don't be afraid to say that you support it, that you support abortion. Don't be afraid to say that you are an atheist. Again, if you don't say that you're an atheist or a free thinker, um, it, it's just further stigmatizing this. So we cannot, if this is not a time where we can live in fear of people's opinions because people's lives are quite literally on the line. The other thing is if you want to ensure that your dollars are going to, to helping somebody get an abortion, the best way to do that is to support a local abortion fund. I will plug Wisconsin's, the Women's Medical Fund of Wisconsin, one of the oldest abortion funds in the nation. Um, I, you know, Women's Medical Fund was around before Roe v. Wade even happened in 1973, and it's still around now. So supporting abortion funds, educating people about crisis pregnancy centers and the dangers of them, spreading awareness about how people can access abortion medication or go to an abortion clinic safely and securely. And get everybody to are vote. And active. Don't and forget to voting. vote. <laughs> yes, we have midterms in the fall. So being vigilant on a local level as well. I should say it's not just about state, it's also about local because even before Roe v. Wade fell and states um, banned abortion, we had local municipalities and counties that were driving abortion clinics out of town with referendums. So stay vigilant on a local level as well. Right. All levels of engagement are important. Right, the courts are not going to protect our fundamental rights in this space. And so it's going to be about um, the political process and everyone remaining really engaged in that down to the to the most local level. I mean, who your district attorney is, is going to matter so much um, in terms of what the law is, how it's being enforced, whether it's being enforced. Um, and so just great advice from Barbara, and um, that's where the hope is now. And we have some questions. I, I'd like to— Oh, go ahead. I, I just want to jump in real quick. Going along with um, what Liz is saying about the courts aren't going to save us, we can't wait for the courts, we have to um, be vigilant about what's going on at all levels. Um, I recently wrote a blog post for Freedom From Religion called We Save Each Other. There is this message that's going around in reproductive health groups saying the Supreme Court won't save us, we save each other. And I cannot agree with that more. In the blog post, I wrote, many religious people are waiting for a God or a God-like figure to save them. Free thinkers know that no such savior is coming. We save each other and the time is now. I love that. And so true. Yes. Wise words. So um, some questions from Audience members today, and um, last week I blew it and read the wrong questions, the wrong date questions, and some of those were actually really good and they were about Dobbs. Um, so I think some of those are thrown on here as well. So we'll get to as many as we can. Um, there is a, so two of these questions are very similar. So I'll read them both and then Annie Laurie, we can um, 
discuss what you think. So Anne asks, does the Satanic Temple stand any chance in their argument for abortion rights as a religious freedom? And then uh, viewer Dan asks, what odds do you give the religious liberty challenge by that synagogue in Florida? So these are kind of two questions of a piece, which boils down to um, organizations and, and religious groups um, like one group is a Jewish group, one group is the Satanic Temple, which is a um, educational organization, um, not a like you know supernatural believing religion. But they are making an, a legal argument, advancing a legal argument in court that they have a religious freedom right to um, abortion and access. I don't know what the what the odds are that they'll win, but I, as I have told our FFF staff, I would love FFF to take a case like this, right. a strong case, if we can find the right plaintiffs in the right circumstances, because it is a freedom of conscience, religious right issue that we have religion dictating their belief in when life begins, and that does not apply to those of us who don't believe in Catholicism or evangelical Protestantism as the synagogue is like, or those of us who are not religious at all. Right. And I think you have to keep pitching everything. You have to fight whatever you can, and certainly it's educational. Whether it can prevail, I don't know. Right. I don't got a crystal ball. And and so much of this is completely uncharted, uncharted territory because, of course, for the last uh, five decades, we have operated under the a legal landscape where this. Um, this was a constitutional question. It's a, you know, we're now going to be, the way I see this, oh, one of the ways I can see this coming up is one of the um, physicians or women who are going to be facing criminal prosecution for violating an abortion ban in their state um, uh, is raising defenses to uh, the, their conduct. And I think uh, having a religious freedom right to engage in conduct in violation of a criminal law in keeping with your own religious or sincerely held beliefs that occupy the place a religious belief would. Um, that's a place where this argument can be made, where, like Annie Laurie's saying, where whether and when life begins um, is a deeply personal and religious question um, well, the, the religious answer to that question is what undergirds these abortion bans. But we who do not uh, have a, a personal religion, we still make these questions. These are moral questions that we answer for ourselves um, using our own sincerely held religion or our sincerely held beliefs and, and values. Um, and so I think there's still there's still going to be all of these different ways in which these legal arguments can be made, different contexts in which they can be made that we haven't even begun to see, and see because the legal landscape has completely, you know, fallen out from uh, under our feet. Um, and who knows what, I mean, I think the, the safe answer to any question with our federal, federal courts right now is results are going to skew very heavily towards the ultra conservative religious uh, privileged outcome. Um, but like I said, you, you might see some of these questions um, or legal uh, theories being advanced in, in state, state courts, court. and, in criminal courts. Yeah. Um, and so who knows? Um, who knows where um, some of these arguments could lead? And but I agree with Annie Laurie. educating the public. Right. And I agree with that's... Annie Laurie. We should be raising every possible argument right. that we have in every context context in which um, this is affecting women and physicians and, and other providers. So I think we've got very little time left. Are there other abortion questions? Yes. So we should probably do those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's so many. What, what about, sorry, what about people who argue for bodily autonomy when it was when it has to do with vaccines, but against it in the case of abortion? Yes, very, right. very good point. Yes, uh, it's it's against my bodily autonomy to have a vaccine to help for herd immunity, but you can, um, but you can um, force a woman to carry through a, a dangerous pregnancy and provide for the. Um, the uh, end result of that pregnancy for 20 some years. I mean, this is really hypocritical. And, and I, you know, I think also it's important that we see a lot of conversations like, well, they can uh, just put it up for adoption. And we have even heard Judge Amy Coney Barrett talk about adoption as being 
uh, an alternative to abortion. Adoption is not an alternative to abortion. It's an alternative to being a parent. Abortion is an alternative. I, I, I should clarify. Adoption isn't an alternative to pregnancy. Adoption is an alternative to raising a child. Abortion is an alternative to pregnancy because if adoption, first of all, there are many Christian based adoption groups that are not ethical, um, that also don't, uh, want to allow, you know, so many of these people that are talking about adoption, they also want to restrict adopt, um, adoption services to LGBTQIA folks. Um, and then also beyond that, the person still is pregnant. They still have to go through nine months of pregnancy, which pregnancy is, it, it, it's not a walk in the park. It's an, it's a difficult thing. It, it could be life endangering endangering, especially if you are a black woman in this country, the chance of dying in pregnancy and childbirth is signif significantly raises. So adoption is not this end all be all solution. Well, yeah, that it just ignores completely the 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 liberty interests that we as women have in our own bodies. I mean, it's, it's the, it, it totally takes out of the yeah, equation. We're, we're a breeding machine so <laughs> someone else can adopt then. Right, exactly. It skips over the whole part where, you know, you are, ac you're actually as a state, when you are saying you cannot make this choice when it comes to whether or not to be pregnant, that, that state is then forcing women who get pregnant to stay pregnant and uh, give birth. I mean, that is right. just gross. Yeah, That's it's, state it's compulsory. It's, it's pregnancy, compulsory pregnancy and, and childbirth. And, yeah, compulsory childbirth, which is 14 times more dangerous than having an abortion. And, and three right. years ago, for, I wrote um, a, uh, a piece for a contest with Freedom From Religion called You Are Not Your Own. And in it, I, I mentioned that people who talk about adoption as an alternative is quite literally commodifying women's bodies. And that's exactly what's going on right now with that type of conversation. So we, do we have time for one more quick question that's not complicated? Oh, yeah, this some, issue. We'll have to come back to this issue. Um, yes, what? Well, I'm gonna give Dan's question. Uh, if pro-life is a religious position, what does the Bible say about abortion? <laughs> well, we just happen to have a what we call a non-tract. What does the Bible say about abortion, which is nothing, zero. Um, and it does actually make the case that life begins at the first breath. But the Bible is very anti-woman and um, anti-children, anti-children's rights, by the way. Um, and you can find that uh, tract or brochure up at our website under publications. You can read it for free. Um, please go there and spread the word about the fact that, um, although it is a very anti-woman book, the Bible actually does not say abortion is murder. Quite the opposite. You can also read Abortion is a Blessing online. That's where That's I read right. it. Um, and it's actually a really, really compelling read, especially as we kind of face this same reality um, going forward. And so, that's also available under the publications link at ffrf.org. Just go to the uh, books and, and you can find the online version. So we're approaching an hour, so we, yeah. we do need to uh, say goodbye for today, but I'm sure we'll have more conversations on this topic as we head into this uh, scary future. Um, but please uh, don't forget to listen to FFRF's radio show. That's Free Thought Matters. And this week, Annie Laurie and Dan Barker will interview Kate Cohen. She's a contributing writer at The Washington Post. Um, they'll talk about her dynamite column last week. As the court faces Christianity on America, it's time for atheists to speak out. And Liz, when does the next episode of We Dissent drop? Yes, We Dissent is our podcast. Uh, it is a, um, a joint production of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the American Humanist Association, and American Atheist. And it is a a uh, monthly podcast hosted by four secular women attorneys, uh, myself and Rebecca Merkert from FFRF included. Uh, and you can uh, find us anywhere that you get your podcasts. And our next um, episode that's coming up in the next couple weeks is on this decision, the Dobbs decision. That's episode six. So check us out. Subscribe to We Dissent. And if you care about abortion rights, you must care about the separation of church and state because as Liz's amicus brief uh, for FFRF before the court and the Dobbs decision documented, 
The organized opposition to abortion rights is purely religious in nature, and they are using our civil laws to force the rest of us to live by their dogmas. So please uh, join FFRF. And I also want to thank Barbara Alvarez for joining us today. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for watching FFRF's Ask an Atheist. We'll be back next Wednesday, noon central, here on Facebook Live.